Thanks very much, and uh, thanks thanks to the or the program committee for inviting me. It's not not at all intimidating to be speaking to uh, outside my field to uh, people who know a lot more about quantum physics than I do, but uh, I'll do my best. So, uh, my uh, theme here is a quote that was from a couple years ago, John Kreskel, in, in the in the talk where he introduced the notion of this uh, computation, had something to say about quantum annealing, which was this, since theorists have not settled whether quantum annealing is powerful, further experiments are needed. And I, I wasn't there, but I like to think that a thrill of excitement just passed through the room when he said this, and everyone went, yes, experiments. We need more experiments. That's what it is. So, um, which I doubt happened, because the fact is, there have been a lot of experiments done on quantum annealers. Uh, experiments we have, not so much theorems, but we have a lot of experimental results, and yet somehow there's still not a consensus about whether quantum annealing is powerful. And so I want to talk about why I think that is. Maybe it's not working. Yeah, well, all right. Whoops. Okay, so uh, I learned a new term recently, about a month ago, called semantic discord. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a term that philosophers use for a situation where people are arguing about some concept, but they're not really arguing about the concept, they're arguing about the meaning of the words used to define the concept. And so some of the great philosophical debates of history often argued over beer, uh, you know, are listed here. Can a machine think? Is a hot dog a sandwich? I recently heard the, the best argument against that. If a hot dog is a sandwich, then a bowl of cereal is soup. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. It's very convincing. Uh, and I think is quantum annealing powerful depends a lot more on what you mean by the word powerful uh, in, in this context. And I want to talk about that. There are a lot of different disciplines uh, looking into quantum computing these days. Quantum performance, which I'll use as the umbrella term for all of these, you know, quantum supremacy and quantum advantage, quantum speed up, all these terms, is uh, has a different meaning in each uh, community that is looking at the performance of quantum computers, and often these meanings are incompatible. And uh, so we have, I think, a lot of semantic discord. <clears throat> So the outline of the talk is I'll give kind of an overview of what we know about quantum, quantum the performance of quantum annealers nowadays, to date, uh, coming from different uh, areas of research. I'll start with complexity theory and then go through uh, physics. Uh, I'll, I'll combine computer science and operations research, which has its own perspective, and I'll say a little bit about uh, applications performance. Uh, just for interest of time, I'm not going to look into what uh, the people who do hardware benchmarking classically think about performance, and I'm only going to talk about optimization performance as opposed to other ap applications. And, you know, as a, as a heads up, it's going to be p about pointing out all of the semantic discord that's going on among these different communities. So, uh, quantum speed up and complexity theory, there was a paper by Papa Giorgio and Traub, uh, which defined quantum speed up. They, they pretty much had Shor's algorithm in mind and comparing Shor's algorithm to the best, uh, classical factoring algorithm. But basically the point is when you have, uh, two algorithms, a quantum algorithm and a classical algorithm, you, you find the worst case costs as a function of n for each of these algorithms. And if you, you call it unqualified quantum speed up, if the ratio of the worst case cost of the classical algorithm to the worst case cost of the quantum algorithm is uh, bounded below by some polynomial in n. You know, you'd, we'd love it, of course, if it were exponential in n, but polynomial it might be good enough. And you call it strong quantum speed up if for every algorithm, if you could show that for every algorithm, this cost, this worst case cost uh, ratio is, is asymptotically at least a polynomial. And uh, so first I want to talk about how that 
uh, theoretical complexity theory definition differs from a, from a uh, you know a empirical analysis if you actually tried to measure this experimentally. And here are some of the points of difference that uh, I'm going to go over. So first off, one difference is theoreticians are always working in the ideal, noise-free, uh, perfect control fidelity environment, and you know the empiricist is working in the open system. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about these other uh, issues as well. So what does that mean? Um, here's an example from a paper I'm sure everyone is familiar with, is, has seen this paper. This is the Google NASA paper about tunneling. It's not a paper about quantum speed up, but it illustrates the point that I want to make, which is that uh, we, if we're doing empirical work, we're working on an open system machine. And basically, that means we have an ideal uh, ideal theoretical algorithm whose performance is mitigated or impaired or, or restricted somehow by the fact that we're operating on a, on a physical machine. And the, the issue is that the machines keep changing. They keep improving and getting better. And in this case, this is a quote from the paper that, uh, that uh, well, they pointed out that the, the run times were, it's not working in here. All right. The, the, um, the, these were experiments on the D-Wave 2X, and the, um, the D-Wave 2X showed an improvement of four orders of magnitude over what they expected to see, extrapolating from their earlier results on the D-Wave 2. So these two red lines uh, mark the difference between what they expected to see and what they actually measured on the D-Wave 2X. And uh, this was due to a lower noise machine and a running at a colder temperature. And they pointed out that this kind of wreaks havoc with your ability to extrapolate and try to find asymptotic results uh, beyond the range of your experiment. Because whatever you measure this year is going to be completely different with next year's model, basically. It changes in time. Uh, it, this question of asymptotic versus finite in, there's, uh, in computer science, there's a famous, famous in some circles, I guess, quote from Knuth, volume three, uh, talking about uh, an open question in a data structure problem. And, he, and it says, empirical evidence suggests strongly that the path length tends to decrease in this parameter k here. A theoretical explanation for this effect is still is lacking. And you can kind of see that the, the strong experimental evidence was everything in the little red box there, and later experiments kind of explained why it couldn't, have, it couldn't be proved. <laughs> there was actually a proof that it must decrease that got revised uh, after, the, after the later experiments. And for those of you unfamiliar with the sacred writings of computer science, uh, you know, finding an error in Knuth is like, like the Feynman lectures having some kind of a mistake on that on, you know, chapter three or something. So it's quite astonishing to, to contemplate this. But the problem here is that these cost functions very often have a lot of low order terms. And these low order terms are what makes these functions go up and down like this. And, and they don't reach asymptopia until the dominant term has had enough time to sort of out, outrace them. And also, when you've got multiple parameters in your experiment, in this case, this is a this is the problem size n is, is shown by the, the um, curves going upward. And another parameter k is on the x-axis here. And it would be reasonable in an experiment that the, the dark vertical line is at k equals n squared. But if you had drawn a line, if you take in your data at k equals n squared over 2, 0.5 n squared, you would have gotten a very different picture of what happens in n. And it would have been a reasonable thing to make k a constant, which means that you know you would be taking your data on a diagonal here. And in whatever parameters you pick for your experiment could give you a very bit different picture of convergence in n. So those are kind of pitfalls of experimental work on algorithms. And there's also this issue about the worst case analysis. Uh, here's a picture of the, the cost function for some uh, brute force algorithm, we'll say. It's got a red worst case and a blue best case, the dots represent all possible endpoints of size n, and your worst case cost is the upper envelope of all of those, and your best case cost is the lower envelope of all of those inputs. And the, the theoretical complexity theory is looking for upper and lower bounds on that worst case curve. 
all right? And what happens in experimental work, if you don't know the worst case, is you're picking random problems, and you can get any kind of curve that might that you might want. For example, factoring, take an easy example, uh, a familiar example. If you did a, if you were trying to show that Shor's algorithm was faster than, uh, that there was quantum speed up from Shor's algorithm, and you did an experiment using <coughs> random inputs, random integers, you would quickly learn that like 60% of all integers, more than 60%, can be, can be factored in constant time. Those would be the integers that end in 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 5, and a third of the remaining ones. That's like a lot of integers. In the median case, factoring is a constant time problem. So, and if you don't know where the worst case is, in this case, everybody has a pretty good idea about where the worst case problems lie. You would, you, you can't, you're not going to be constant time with your, with your quantum algorithm. You can't actually find a speed up on those random instances. So, part of the, the challenge in doing empirical work to study quantum performance is finding hard enough test instances that you can actually see a separation from, uh, you know, being easy for everything. And that's often very hard to do. And the third uh, kind of a subtle point is when a theoretician talks about an algorithm, they're talking about an abstraction of a real algorithm, basically. And the empiricist is measuring, like, runtime of code, and there's a big gap there, a big sort of difference in the conclusions you can draw. Non-determinism, really, is the idea that for any input or for any problem, there is a, an infinite set of possible execution paths for algorithms, and it's like the set of all possible ways of computational paths you could use to solve an input. And what happens with some problem is someone comes along and defines an algorithm like brute force that says, take every you know, input and, or take every possible solution and iterate through it. And, uh, then someone actually implements it and decides to start at a particular place and iterate in a certain way. And then, and then we code it up and there may be some other decisions. And you may end up at the binary point with some user parameters, some, you know, some runtime parameters that the user can set. And often there's a random, pseudo random algorithm. So there's yet unspecified what the, the user parameters are going to be and what the random, uh, the pseudo random number generator is going to do. But then you run the thing and you get exactly one computation path. You run it once. And that's the, actually the deterministic algorithm. One computation path per input. That's the thing we measure. And, you know, the theoretician back at the algorithm stage says, well, it doesn't matter how you implement it. It doesn't matter how you code it up. There's got to be one input on which it's going to uh, take its maximum worst case time, and there has to exist one input on which it stops immediately, and that's how you get upper and lower bounds. But when you're actually narrowing down your choices, it's a specific input that makes your specific algorithm experience its worst case or its best case time. And the challenge in empirical work is, is observing these very specific cases and then trying to generalize backwards to the more general situation. So what this all means, really, is that uh, empirical work to settle theoretical questions is really not on the table. Where There's never going to be a theoretical demonstration that P doesn't equal NP. All right, there's never going to be an empirical demonstration that P doesn't equal NP. The theory is the theory. You can do all the experiments you want, but you, you, the theorem, experiments are finite. And they can be used to demonstrate the existence of some property or, you know, some quantity or op op some phenomenon. And they can be used to demonstrate as a counterexample to a conjecture about for all that, that for, it doesn't occur for all. But they can't really address those upside down A's and those backwards E's with the slashes through them. Those are the two problematic issues. So, so there we are. The empirical, there's kind of a fundamental difference between what you can learn uh, empirically and what you can learn theoretically about these problems. So let's, so that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing experiments, though. Uh, there's plenty of stuff to be learned and plenty of new insights to be gained by um, 
by, uh, you, you know, using experiments to study performance. So, uh, and obviously I'm not really going to explain uh, quantum speed up to the people, the authors of the paper that, that, that kind of have defined quantum speed up here, but I'll just give a quick gist of it to remind us all. The, the defining and detecting quantum speed up paper with, with you know, some follow up papers as well, um, basically said, here's what we're going to call quantum speed up. We're going to define, we're going to, uh, the, the challenge is to demonstrate an input set, a generated input set, such that given a quantum algorithm and a small handful of uh, classical algorithms, such that the scaling of the, the all the best, the best of all of the classical algorithms is worse than the scaling of the quantum algorithm over a finite range of n. So this is like a, a you know, a very thoughtful uh, attempt to get around those upside down A's, to look at a specific set of generated instances instead of all possible instances, to look at scaling over a finite range instead of asymptotic scaling, and um, you know, there are various qualifiers on the type of quantum speed up according to the, comp the competition that you choose. So, uh, and one sort of notable point I want to make about this work is that, uh, the, the, this notion of true scaling, when you're, when you know that you're dealing with, with uh, algorithms of finite n, uh, the approach is to take uh, to do what you can to sort of strip away the low order terms and ignore the things that are interfering with your view of asymptopia and measure the part that actually scales with them. And part of that is, uh, means that you have to optimize the work. The, in the, for example, for simulated annealing, you have to optimize the, um, the anneal time, the number of sweeps of your algorithm, uh, according to n. So if you have a fixed anneal time, you get these colorful lines that are convex upwards, but we, you know that that's not the true scaling because any fixed anneal time, when the problem gets bigger, it's, it's gonna just crash and burn and you're gonna get this, you know, this shooting up of, uh, of the asymptotic cost. So what you have to do is, is take the lower envelope of all of the anneal times and that's, that's the true scaling there. So, uh, there are variations. There's a little semantic discord going on within the, the, the papers. You see, I think, whether or not it's necessary. If you have QPU times that you can't optimize because there's one anneal time that's optimal throughout your range, what do you do about that? And one school of thought would say, well, the experiment is inconclusive uh, if you can't see a change in uh, the quantum annealing times and others, uh, go ahead and analyze it anyway. So there are some variations, uh, within this field, but that's more or less the gist of it. I hope Daniel will agree. That's <laughs> the gist of it. So, um, so here's the thing about NP though. Um, this thing about non-determinism means that for any particular input or for any, uh, small set of generated inputs, I'll say, there exists, there's an existence proof of an algorithm that solves that input optimally, like optimally fast, as its optimal case. And, because this is the set of all possible uh, execution paths for, the, for solving problems. And in the intractability, this is, uh, the end, non-determinism is the N and NP. Intractability of the problem is about finding the right algorithm finding the fast algorithm to solve the problem just as much as it is given an algorithm, you know, how fast does it take to solve the problem? So it's kind of like you have this problem area that is, uh, you know, hard in general. And that's, uh, that's when you're like searching, you don't know anything about a particular input. You're like doing an unstructured search for the uh, algorithm for it. But whenever someone defines a particular input and says solve this one, or a particular class, a narrower class of uh, problems and say solve these, that adds structure. And it's easier to find algorithms if you've narrowed down the search space uh, to a particular set of inputs. So what happens is even though the problem, the whole problem is very hard, particular subclasses end up being solved uh, more easily. And, and you know, the most extreme example of this, I think, was the, an RSA challenge in the uh, 70s, I think, or the 90s. No, that was when it was solved. So 17 years before 1994. There was a problem set, a particular uh, encoded encrypted uh, message 
that said solve, solve this, you know, un encrypt, decrypt this by factoring this particular number. And the very carefully done estimate of how much time it would take was four quadrillion years uh, from 1974-ish or something like that. It turns out 17 years of looking for the algorithm, the right algorithm for that problem, plus an eight months of computation, it didn't take four quadrillion years a after all. So that's kind of the most extreme example. You see this a lot. They, a lot of uh, people, you know, different groups set uh, annual algorithm challenges, like maximum satisfiability, different things. And they, they have instituted coping strategies for the, the problem. If you set a bunch of, of test problems and you ask everyone to solve them, and then you use the same test problems ma ma next year, everybody, everything gets easier because everybody's had a, a year to work on making their algorithms faster for that input. So they have to have some sort of a coping strategy to avoid that sort of teaching for the test. And you see this also in these quantum supremacy proposals that pop up. Here's a very hard problem. Let's use this for demonstrating quantum supremacy. And instantly, all the grad students in the world light up and say, whoa, maybe it's not so hard after all if I really focus all my time on it. And you know, you see these announcements, it's not so hard after all. So, so this is kind of a common occurrence that the, you know, you're solving these sub-problems doesn't make the, the problem class any easier. It's just a special case that you've solved and it really doesn't get you forward in uh, solving the whole problem. But, you know, it happens a lot. <clears throat> so, um, what does this mean for quantum speed up? Well, basically, so over on the right here, we have, over on the left, we have a sort of a schematic of some algorithm. And all the inputs in the world at problem size 80 are shown there, all of them. And, you know, the hard ones make it give it a worst case and the, the easy ones in green give it a best case. And we're kind of trying to find out if there's a quantum algorithm that never experiences such a terrible worst case. It only gets kind of pink, you know, but it never gets really red in terms of its, of its uh, action. And so you set up these experiments. You can't do all possible experiments. So you set up some class of experiment. You compare your quantum solver on the left to your classical solver on the right. And you learn in this case, the quantum solver on that set of inputs is giving you green performance and the classical is giving you kind of medium red performance. So, but, and this can be scaling or just absolute runtime. So I'm, you know, just, just in a generic performance. So fine, the quantum solver is scaling better. But as you add more solvers, as you, as you talk about for all known solvers, then people start inventing new solvers. People start uh, doing exhaustive searches of all the possible parameter space for the solvers they have. And you're just trying more and more solvers here. There's an existence proof of better, better things in there somewhere. And over time, the, the problem that was originally hard tends to get easier because you're looking at a larger space of classical competition. So uh, for quantum speedup, looking at the general class of all inputs and all algorithms for them, it is true that for all algorithms, there exists an input such that that algorithm ha scales poorly, which has some worst case behavior that makes it scale poorly. But it is not the case in the big set of NP hard problems that there's one input that's hard for everything. And so, so if you're looking for an input that is hard for all known algorithms, and your known algorithms, the set of known algorithms and their parameterizations keeps increasing, eventually you're going to find something that solves it faster. And so it becomes very difficult to find a problem that's hard for all of the algorithms we know of in all of their, in all their permutations. And there's a challenge there. And you can see this, you know, an out, uh, inputs are proposed, someone writes a paper, saying, well, that's not very hard. Here's a, here's a way to solve it. And then harder inputs are proposed. And then someone finds a way to not make that one work. And there's sort of this cycle. That is progress, really. We're learning a lot more about what makes algorithms hard and what makes them easy. But it does mean that, uh, as a, as a research question, it's, it's, you know, that the idea of finding this one input, uh, small input generated input class, that is hard for everything you know of. You know, I, I 
put that on the category of grand challenge. It's not, people have tried it in other areas of, of, uh, empirical computer science and, and it's just very challenging to find, uh, these hard by consensus problems. The one example would be RSA has built a, uh, you know, has built an industry around the presumed hardness of, of factoring a certain class of inputs. And there's maybe an example with, with hard satisfiability instances at a critical point. They experience a phase transition. But the fact is those problems have gotten easier over the years as algorithms that are tuned for, uh, these random inputs have been, have been implemented. All right, so uh, moving on to another area of empirical work on uh, classical and quantum algorithms. In the computer science OR community, there's a tradition of uh, looking at optimization algorithms and opt optimization heuristics. And it, an optimization problem is an NP-hard problem that has an objective function, basically. So you guys are pretty familiar with a bunch of those things. And it's known that, assuming P doesn't equal NP, it's not possible to find an algorithm that can solve all solutions, find optimal solutions in polynomial time to every input in the class. But it's really not a problem to get two out of three. So we have exact algorithms that guarantee to solve every problem to optimality. Sometimes they're polynomial, sometimes they're exponential. We have approximation algorithms that run in polynomial time, uh, work on every input, and guarantee to solve it to within a certain ratio of optimal, but they can't guarantee an optimal solution. And we have uh, specialized problems, also called tailored, pro uh, tailored algorithms, that can solve a subclass of inputs to optimality in polynomial time, but they don't work on all, uh, all inputs. And some, a lot of algorithms belong to different subsets of the, or combinations of these classes, but, but, uh, you know, there we are. That's what we have. And furthermore, there's a no free lunch theorem for optimization. It's an actual theorem. <laughs> We've been talking, I've been hearing that a lot lately, but, but, uh, and it's a theorem that applies uh, to a specific class of algorithms, deterministic exact algorithms. But there's a no free lunch principle which you can, you, you can, it doesn't apply specifically to everything, but you can also say as a general rule, uh, that, uh, it applies to, you know, the search for, for, as a rule of thumb, it applies to other, to all, to classical algorithms. So, and the implications of this theorem are that if you take, uh, any, any particular algorithm, deterministic algorithm, a vertical slice here, and look at all of the costs associated with all of the inputs, you get an average cost, and that cost is the same no matter what, what algorithm you choose from this class. And uh, that kind of means that the weight of, of, you know, it's a mean, so the weight of the algorithm, all the algorithms are balanced. And so good algorithm performance in one, on one input class must be offset by equally bad performance on another input class. And they're sort of all the same, and uh, there's no intrinsically hard input class that is hard for all of them, they, they all switch around in that way. So what that means is that um, you're kind of uh, it's always going to get the same worst case with, with algorithms for these, uh, for these exact, uh, at least the case is true for exact deterministic algorithms. And um, it applies to all classical, the principle is the informal part, but you can kind of argue that the same kind of uh, there might, for every, uh, great performance you see, there's gonna be horrible performance on something else. Applies to classical algorithms. Uh, anything that moves state by, step by step through a state space, basically there's gonna be something that it finds first, and there's gonna be something that it finds last, and that's your best case and your worst case that's gonna happen. Uh, quantum algorithms, though, that we know don't move through the state space step by step, and so, so the, you know, there's a whole different paradigm there, and that's, that's kind of where, our, you know, where we might get a, an edge of an advantage, I would say. Uh, and also let me point out, uh, you know, all of the empirical work that's being done pretty much is, is being done on heuristics. Simulated annealing, parallel tempering, all of these, you know, gen uh, genetic algorithms 
These are, a heuristic is an algorithm that doesn't have a theorem associated with its performance. It just kind of works, we hope, or the, there might be some trivial theorems. That means we don't know which category it belongs to of these three categories of algorithms for optimization. And even if it were an exact algorithm, a heuristic doesn't provide a certificate of optimality like branch and bound does. And so uh, they're kind of not considered very interesting for uh, exact problems because it's really about certifying optimality in, in applications, I would say. And very often they come highly parameterized with a lot of hand tuning for the user in hopes that the user can provide some human intuition about the problem that would allow it to work well on these, on these uh, particular in inputs. They're kind of, there are certain parts of the community that think there's just nothing of interest there. That would be the complexity theory community. Um, you don't see these simulated annealing published in theoretical computer science literature. Uh, but the fact is they work well in practice and you know an awful lot of uh, uh, actual computation gets done using using these heuristics. So uh, how do you how do you evaluate the performance of an optimization heuristic? Basically, there are three dimensions uh, that you could look at. How much time does it take? Uh, what is the quality of solutions it gives you? And then how uh, wide is the breadth of applicability, of, of application of this, of this algorithm? You kind of want things that are going to work on a, a broad variety. And these correspond to those three, uh, you know, the three possible, the three categories, basically. And so what happens in, in uh, empirical work is very often you'll take a, a two-dimensional slice. You'll take one input class and look at the convergence time versus solution quality. Or you'll take a whole bunch of input classes, take a fixed time to run them all, and then you'll look at how does the solution, how did the solution quality of your different uh, heuristics, your different solvers, vary as a function of the inputs uh, when you're running it under fixed time conditions. So that's very often the type of analysis you see. Uh, generally, algorithms that don't require a lot of hand tuning are preferred, they're robust, so, you know, there's no human in the loop trying to, trying to make them go fast. And in any case, it's, there's a lot of, uh, methodological work, uh, uh, you know, papers published talking about, uh, how do you, how do you equalize the tuning effort to make a fair test? It's called. So, um, here's an example of uh, this kind of analysis applied to the, uh, a 2000 Q system. Uh, one, uh, this is a paper that's um, in uh, a D-Wave tech report. Um, but on the left we have, you know, a slice that takes uh, runtime versus solution quality. The pink uh, stars uh, are uh, what the quantum annealer did if you're only measuring anneal times. And the red stars a little bit to the right are its runtime when you're including um, programming and readout time, which is what the the user is more likely is going to experience. And what you see with all these different classical algorithms, some you could probably guess what they are, but I'm not going to go into them, is, is this uh, sort of typical classical convergence, a slow convergence in runtime down to, or, you know, with runtime, the solution quality makes this sort of, you know, characteristic convergence pattern. And whereas the quantum annealer just drops down, boom, and gives you a, it gives you a pretty good solution. This may not be the optimal solution. And, uh, you can see that this one HF, HFS it is, is almost getting there. And, you know, it's quite possible that if you give the classical algorithms a little more time, uh, and if you, you know, it, it would actually find a ground state faster than the quantum algorithm. And, and we have an error, a, a emerging error model to explain that, which I'll talk about later. But, uh, so what we what we tend to see is that, uh, if, if the time to get to optimality can be worse than classical or about the same as classical depending upon the input, but very commonly on, on a lot, on a lot of different kinds of inputs, it, it is a very good, very quickly getting to near optimality, very close to optimal. And, uh, so that's kind of one way to look at it. Here's another, uh, on the right is a, a collection of 120 problems from eight, 15 each from eight problem classes. And in this case, they were all given the same amount of fixed time. Uh, I think it was 50 milliseconds, if I recall correctly. I should have written that down. 
And all of the uh, solvers, in this case, we took each solver and gave it three different parameter settings. So you see three, three pink ones and three purple ones and so forth. And we gave every, every uh, solver the same amount of time and then looked at the distributions of solution quality. This is an empirical distribution plot where you just sort the solution, the normalized solutions. And you can see in this kind of a uh, display that the worst case uh, performance is, is how high these lines are on their right side. So the quantum annealer is doing very well in all three versions. Uh, the median performance would be uh, the the how high the curve is on the on its 50th problem, the 50th best solution that it got, and the mean performance would be the areas under the different curves. So on this collection of eight different problem classes, uh, the quantum annealer is doing very well at getting to these near optimal solutions faster than, or getting better solutions than the other solvers in this fixed time limit. So the big question though, what about application inputs? If you have application inputs, you have to uh, embed them. It creates chains that compresses the problem scale. And even though we're getting, you know, to within uh, just, uh, you know, less than 0.001 percent of the of the you know the best of the of the ground state in, in these cases, or we might we might be. I guess in this case we don't actually know what the ground state is. Um, it may not come out the same in the application inputs because the problem scale is compressed, and so maybe you're not getting as close to optimal. So uh, there's not much, but there's a little bit of a uh, few studies that have, have started to emerge looking at quantum annealing from this point of view with respect to classical solvers running on the unembedded original problem versus the quantum annealer running on the embedded quantum problem. There was a paper by Tremor and Koch uh, where they see this exact same, you know, the red solver is the quantum annealer. It very quickly drops down to an excellent solution, and all the classical solvers are taking their sweet time catching up. Uh, they reported that the gap between the quantum system and the optimal solution was 0.4%. So that's getting within 0.996 of an optimal solution on those application problems. And there was a recent paper by Younger et al. that was just published looking at inputs from airline gate scheduling. And they also were getting, uh, op you know, distance from optimal that's better than 1%, like 9.96% or something like that. So that's uh, promising, you know, things so far, I, two, two robins does not make a spring, but, uh, you know, and we need bigger problems and we're waiting for the, you know, the new chips to really be able to test this. Thoroughly, but um, but in this uh, definition of quantum performance, uh, it, it, there's sort of this consistent pattern that we're seeing a lot of times. All right. So, what about the users? Does any of this have anything to do with our users, uh, the paying customers? We like to call them. The customer is always right, of course. So, and uh, there we have now Qubit's uh, user group meetings twice a year, one in Europe and one in. North America for the last three or four years, and um, you're, we're starting to hear experimental, re you know, reports from the users on their experiments uh, using the quantum system. Most of the reports are, I tried it, it worked, I figured out how to translate it, their proof of concept without evaluation, but there have been a few examples of performance evaluation. In this case, the inputs come from their application that they're, the problem they're trying to solve, of course. And uh, they're usually not comparing against all possible solutions. They're comparing uh, against what they, what their industry standard is or what the company is already using. And um, what they call performance is completely different from everything I've been talking about before. It's highly dependent upon the use case and the industry. So, and also I should point out that, you know, a 1% or 5% difference in improvement in performance can be huge, you know, if it if it gives you if it saves you half a million dollars a year or something. So they they're often quite satisfied with small gains in performance. So here are two recent uh, examples. One from Recruit was looking at a list optimization problem in e-commerce. So they this is the case where you need fast response times because it's an online uh, you know query uh, that people are making. 
And what they did basically was uh, they had a, a linear objective function and they added this notion of trying to get diversity. It's about ordering the response to a, to a, a query, you know, to your, your website. And they made it a quadratic object, uh, function to uh, not only have to, you know, to put the, the best sellers, the most likely to sell options at the top, but also to create some diversity to give. So you wouldn't have a lot of redundancy in the top. And they found a sales uplift of 1%. Uh, and, you know, they compared it to CPLEX and, you know, they're happy customers. If they're happy, we're happy. I'm happy. Anyway. And another, uh, Denso with their, is scheduling their automated, I don't know if you've seen their great demo they have of these little carts moving around in factories. Uh, tried, uh, the, uh, the D-Wave 2000Q, uh, at a problem involving scheduling little carts running around a factory so that to, in order to minimize the wait time at intersections. And also they were getting good results. That's another example of the sort, sort of short wait time that is required to get a response. So that's kind of the area where the sweet spot right now where we're seeing the, the good performance. All right. So, uh, finishing up then. So what has been demonstrated? People actually here I work for D-Wave in their, you know, benchmarking department and I get buttonholed like, so is D-Wave demonstrated quantum advantage, quantum speed up? And I've learned to say, tell me what you mean by quantum speed up and I will answer your question because the answers are different according to which community is asking the question basically. And it's also true that a demonstration of, you know, they just saved us a half a million dollars a year is not really going to resonate with, uh, with looking at scaling advantage and vice versa. It's not going to resonate with looking at, you know, the, the sort of academics approach to trying to find general rules of thumb and general properties. So, so these are distinct areas in that sense where, where good, performance in one area that isn't just isn't going to resonate with another area. So the takeaway, semantic discord, the word for the week, I think. When when all these different, you know, there are all these different ways to define and to measure and to evaluate the performance of a quantum computer. And um, there's not there's not one way to do it. I don't think one discipline is going to be able to talk another discipline into doing it our way. And so what we need is, you know, more world peace and tolerance for other people's points of view. So uh, with that, I'm finished. Uh, is there an appropriate way to reflect the time that it takes to tune an algorithm in the comparison of the algorithms? Because you might be able to solve a problem way faster than another algorithm after doing a yeah, exactly. good amount of tuning. And then by the time that you tune the, 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 the faster solver, the slower solver might be able to solve the problem. Right. Right, so, uh, so these, you know, I was talking about these annual competitions and what they do to, tr to avoid, uh, you know, it's a natural tendency to want your solver to be the best one and to win. And so, uh, so some things they do, uh, they ge generally insist on a wide variety of inputs to be, you know, it's never just one input set. It, you know, there's repositories with thousands of inputs from hundreds of uh, different sources. So, and it's awfully hard to tune when you have that broad of a, a range of inputs to tune for. They'll require uh, all uh, submitted competition solvers can't have any parameters at all. Uh, they'll, they'll say, here are some samples, but we're not going to release the actual test inputs until the, you know, a week before the competition or, you know, they, they set time limits to, that make it impossible to tune because there's not enough time to do it. Uh, some uh, organizers of these competitions just say, let us submit your code and we'll run it for you. And so, but, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and then there are, you know, there are papers about, uh, sort of procedurally, if you're just trying five different things and you, you're not invested in any, any one, like how you can ensure that your, 
that you're giving each one a fair amount of the same tuning. And it's often accounting for the human time, making sure the same person codes all the, the different, uh, so, you know. So there are, there are guidelines for running those kinds of tests. Uh, hello. Uh, in the experiments where you were talking about uh, comparison to classical methods, uh, could you say something about like the precision of the the, the weights? Uh, because if uh, a machine just has gives always the optimal solution, but has a very limited precision, you mean, then you mean these? yeah, yeah. G uh, yeah, so these clause last problems are in this uh, tech report uh, that you can get off for the D-Wave server. They're um, something like, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about the weights and then or how they're constructed and then we can talk about precision. There's something like the Google NASA weak strong clusters. You know, there's sort of a heavy positive uh, cluster and then there's a weaker negative cluster and everything has to flip except they are uh, not adjacent to each other on the Chimera page and they're, it's a larger, they're larger clusters and they're moved uh, further distance from one another. But there is, uh, the thing about those cluster problems is they, it's kind of a poor man's error correction, right? You get a whole chunk of things and your problem scale is sort of artificially lifted out of that error zone. So it's, it's uh, uh, you know, individually they had precision, I think, uh, you know, a small, small number of different variable values between like 1.5, you know, three quarters and, you know, a small number of variables. But then when you put them together in clusters, they kind of add up and that, that helps you, helps the quantum annealer. Um, the, the problems over here from these eight classes, you know, they were random spin glasses. There were, uh, I'd have to remember all eight of them, but they, they were all kinds. I mean, the idea was to get some variety. Uh, of, uh, you know, of um, examples there. They were all native in this case, all native problems that were generated directly on the Chimera graph, but frustrated cluster loops were there. Uh, I think deceptive, uh, deceptive cluster loops and maybe um, frustrated loops and spin glasses and, you know, things like that, things that had appeared in the literature except for one or two new ones that, that were in the paper. All right, thank you. So, um, um, thank you for a good talk. Uh, you defined, uh, I guess, the grand challenge is finding uh, speed up, basically a quantum uh, scaling speed up. Uh, but I mean, at least to me, uh, a good practical challenge would be to basically find a single instance of a single problem the D-Wave could solve and other algorithms can't. I, or I guess I offer it as a challenge. And so, this would... So there is the Albash and Lidar result where, you know, it's a gadget graph, but it's uh, quantum speed up against optimized simulated annealing. No, so but, but these, are, these are instances that, again, classical algorithms can solve. Other ones, yeah. So, well, so that's my point. If you keep growing your space of the, all those classical algorithms and you keep, you know, if you spend a weekend tuning your parameters to, to say you've solved it in, you know, 20 microseconds, then I'm kind of skeptical that under those test circumstances it's going to be possible to find this sort of magic ombudsman input that uh, hits the weaknesses of every classical solver in, in the pool. Uh, but doesn't hit the quantum. But just as an example, I mean, if you solve, uh, say, RSA 120 or RSA 200, well, the then you're done. I mean, this is a single problem that people would be impressed if you solve them. I but see. well, so but it's been solved. <laughs> I can generate another one. Okay. Well, so we can do uh, uh, what's the I think what's the one qubit result 14. Uh, Numbers up to two hundred thousand. So, uh, but the you know in that case, I think the um, the uh, millisecond programming time you know is not necessarily going to beat the you know the nanosecond instruction times of, of classical solvers. So uh, that is going to need a much bigger you know input set than we can currently test. Thank you.